Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. My name is Cheryl Reynolds. I'm with the UC Statewide IPM program, and welcome to today's UC Ag Expert Talk. Today we have Dr. Phoebe Gordon. She's a University of California Cooperative Extension Orchard Systems Advisor in Madera and Merced counties. And today she's speaking on evaluating soil salinity and on soil, plant tissue, and water reports. And so now I'm going to pass this over to Phoebe. So you can go ahead and share your screen. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am excited to be able to speak to you all today. And I know that, uh, well, I, I don't cover, um, you know, I cover a deciduous tree species. And so um, uh, I don't cover citrus, but uh, my area of expertise is in um, almonds, pistachios, and figs. And so a lot of the photos you're going to be seeing today are of the crops that I work with. Um, however, um, the, the basics about uh, understanding plant tissue, soil, and water reports don't really differ between crops. Um, and if I can, uh, well, when I talk about tissue sampling, if anyone works with horticultural species, I will um, mention uh, how to sample for those. So before I start, um, anyone who works with any agricultural crops, if you have not visited the CDFA crop fertilization guidelines, I really highly encourage you to do so. Um, a lot of the things I'm going to be covering today, like um, especially for specific crops, things like um, how to interpret leaf tissue tests, you can, you can find there. Um, they also have some information on how to do plant tissue sampling and soil sampling as well. And so I do have a link here. Um, and you can also just, usually when I find it, I just Google it. And so um, they have a lot of really great information there. Okay, so I wanted to cover before we begin with what reports can do for you and what they can't, um, because it's really important to remember that any of these reports are a snapshot of what your orchard or your soil looks like. And uh, you just have to keep in mind that you're looking at um, you're looking at your orchard or whatever crop you're working with at a moment in time. And so these will allow you to monitor for changes in salinity and nutrition levels. Um, they can alert you to deficiencies that are starting to crop up before symptoms show. Um, if you're producing, you want to make sure, well, by the time you see nutrient deficiency symptoms, your yield is already affected. Sometimes they can help you diagnose issues outside of, um, outside of a, uh, outside of nutrient issues. And for those of you who need to fill out nutrient management plans, um, you'll need some pieces of these information. And uh, if you need to deal with salinity, they can allow you to calculate a gypsum requirement. So I will say lab reports for many crops cannot generate accurate fertilizer recommendations because um, you need to take yield into account, especially if you're working with orchard crops. Something that I really want to stress is that these reports are only as good as the sample you submit. And so if you don't do sampling at the correct time, you don't sample the correct way, you hold samples without properly preparing them for storage. Um, so for example, if you're sampling a really big site, pulling a ton of leaf tissue samples, you cram them into a plastic bag and you let them sit in a hot truck for a week, those samples are going to deteriorate and they're not going to be useful for a test. Um, you need to also make sure you take into account infield variation and you do not want to include fertilizer or gypsum in soil samples. So I, I actually used to work for an ag testing lab before I became an extension advisor. And, you know, we would see this occasionally that people would just pulse uh, soil samples without really paying attention to what they were doing and they would have these fertilizer prills in it. And um, if you're trying to see what's going on, that's going to definitely affect your sample quality. I will say that um, also uh, labs can make mistakes. Uh, everyone's human. And so if you see something weird, contact them. Um, most labs will retest samples. Um, you also, I'll say if you submit 50 samples to a lab and want them all retested, uh, they may not <laughs> do it for free. But um, you know, most labs are, are happy with uh, looking at uh, any incorrect sample. They want to make sure that they're giving out quality results to you. OK, 
Okay, so I'm going to cover plant tissue tests and um, I will, if we have a little bit of time, I'll try to make sure I answer a couple of questions while folks are taking the quiz as well. Okay, so plant tissue tests are best as a feedback for your nutrition program. And so um, the way that these leaf tissue standards are for the most part evaluated or established is that um, there is some sort of fertilizer response trial and they, um, they, they look at where, uh, where do you get maximum or as close to maximum yield as possible. Um, well, I should say you get 90% yield um, and they, they look at leaf tissue standards based on that. Um, for some nutrients, what they do is they pull from well-performing orchards, especially for nutrients that, um, that aren't commonly deficient in the area. I'll say some labs will offer leaf tissue standards outside of these times. So for the crops that I'm familiar with, it's gonna be July leaf tissue samples. And so for almonds and pistachios, there's also a early prediction tool that's been validated by research. And um, so when I talk about these results um, with uh, folks that I go on farm calls with, um, they will have questions sometimes about where these standards come from. Um, I don't know, usually labs will develop them themselves. I just want to stress that there's a difference between the result that you get back from the lab and the standard that they apply to it to tell you whether or not you are deficient or sufficient in a certain nutrient. So again, there is the results that you get from the lab where they test a leaf and they give you X percent nitrogen. And then there's the standards that they use to tell you whether or not they're deficient or not. So, um, you know, so for UC, we have our specific timing. So for almonds and pistachios, it's the July leaf tissue samples. Um, and that has been validated by research. So just to go over a couple of terms. Um, so a macronutrient, well, an essential nutrient is something that a plant needs to complete its life cycle and produce fruit and grow normally. And so there are two different kinds of nutrients. There's a macronutrient, which is a nutrient that's required in larger concentrations. And those tend to be measured as percentages. And then a micronutrient is a nutrient that's required in smaller concentrations. And those are parts per million. So macronutrients are not more important than micronutrients. They're all required by the plant. You just, if you need to apply a macronutrient, you need to apply more of it than with micronutrients. It can also be really helpful to understand nutrient mobility in plants. And so um, there are mobile nutrients and immobile nutrients, and that's gonna help you determine where to look for nutrient deficiencies. So a mobile nutrient like nitrogen and potassium will be moved from older leaves to newer leaves as the plants are deficient. An immobile nutrient, it's, you, it's, it's in plant compounds that cannot be easily broken down, like a cell wall. And so something like iron will show up in the new leaf tissues. So I just have um, photos of magnesium deficiency on the left. And so it's a little bit hard to see, but this is at towards the base of um, the season's growth. And so this is where the nutrient is showing, the nutrient deficiency is showing up. And you can look at the newer leaves towards the tip of a branch. They look fine. Iron deficiency, um, it's, this is the tip of a branch right here, and this is where you're seeing the, uh, the, the diagnosis or the, the deficiency symptoms. And so um, again, because I, uh, I'm not talking about specific crops here, I'm just talking about general uh, analyses. I'm not gonna go over specific deficiency symptoms because they can differ. And I, you know, I know some crops pretty well and I don't know other crops really well, and so I don't wanna say anything that's incorrect. And so, um, I would talk to an expert in the crop that you are interested in when you're trying to identify what symptoms are. So it's also important to understand how you want, how you sample for leaf tissue tests, and this will follow for general soil tests as well. And so you want to know first what your orchard looks like, if you have any wild variations in soil types, um, if you're trying to diagnose, you know, a good area and bad area, you do need to know where those areas are. Um, but if, assuming that your orchard is uniform, you want to wander through it at random. Select leaves from all four quadrants of the tree, so that's north, south, east, west. Um, generally, it's sun exposed leaves. Make sure those trees are at least 40 feet apart um, because there can be small variations in soil. 
And so you might have, um, if you're only selecting for one area, you're at risk of not getting an accurate picture of the entire orchard. You don't want to combine good and bad areas. Um, occasionally we would get this at the lab that someone would just send in one bag of leaves and they um, would expect the lab to sort those out. Um, a, a lab that specializes in plant diagnostics may do that, but uh, fertility, general fertility labs don't. They just treat one bag as one sample. Because we manage nutrition based on irrigation blocks, it's best to not combine irrigation blocks. So anything that you would be having under a different you know, fertilization scheme or set is you want to separate out samples across those. And in general, if you're dealing with really large blocks, um, it's best to split those up. So when you're going to get the results, so again, when I'm talking about a result, we can look here. So the result from a plant tissue test, if we're looking at this deficient range, would be 2.2. And so then research would tell you whether or not 2.2% nitrogen is deficient or optimum. So in general, you're going to get a range from deficient to excess, or um, if you're thinking about nutrients that tend to have really negative effects on plants, you, you might call excess toxicity. And so you might just get low optimum and high or excess, or you can get this wider range here. Um, but in general, if you're below optimum, your plants are deficient. If you're above optimum, you, and especially if you have a lower than expected yield, you can start pulling back on nutrient applications. Something to keep in mind for many crops is that these leaf tissue standards are set when the current crop is in development or mostly completed with development. And so these leaf tissue tests will tell you what the orchard is going to look like next year, not in the current year. And I will also say from looking at leaf tissue tests, um, you also want to take just the appearance of the orchard or the plant into account when you're thinking about what these results mean. So if you have, uh, if you have nutrient uh, symptoms or um, nutrient test results that look fine, but you have really poor vigor in your orchard, it probably means there's something else going on aside from nutrition. Okay, so I do want to make a note that plant nutrient status is not just a factor of your fertilization program, although it for the most part is, um, but there are some circumstances when plants will have a hard time taking up nutrients. So wet, cold and wet soils, especially at the beginning of the season, will reduce nutrient uptake. That's because when plants take up nutrient, it's a very, they need to expend energy to do it. And um, well, without getting into too, too, too much, it's basically a chemical reaction. And so chemical reactions will slow down when temperatures are colder. And so their, their ability to take up specific nutrients like iron, for example, is less um, in those conditions. And so you might see trees with what looks like an iron deficiency in the early part of the season. Um, and then later in the year, they, they green up and they look normal. Compacted soils will also affect nutrient uptake. Um, in rare cases, I would say mostly in container soils where they're really light and fluffy and have a lot of pore space, they may increase nutrient uptake, especially for something that doesn't move easily through the soil. And that's because they put roots in closer contact with soil particles. But for the most part, compaction is very bad. And so um, it can decrease nutrient uptake by decreasing either the movement of nutrients through the soil so if you can't get water through and you're applying something that moves with water like nitrogen, the nitrogen is also not getting there, but it also reduces root growth. And so roots can't reach new pools of nutrient and it reduces the flow of oxygen into soils. And so um, ox roots need oxygen to survive. They respire just like animals do. And then that's because the compounds that are made in photosynthesis aren't actually moved to the roots. They move sugars to the roots. And so roots need oxygen to break down those sugars and create energy compounds. Um, and so taking up nutrients takes a lot of energy. And so anything that reduces that is going to impede plant roots ability to take up nutrients. Some phytotoxicity symptoms also look like nutrient deficiencies, um, especially if you're not really familiar with looking at them. 
So a really common case that I see in almonds is glyphosate drift and zinc deficiency can look very similar. Um, I, these are different species here, but they're in the same genus. And so they tend to, to have similar responses to things. So a classic zinc deficiency symptom is very short internodes, very small leaves. And in prunus species, those leaves look needle-like, um, but glyphosate will also do a very similar thing. And so um, if, you, you know, if you don't know the orchard history, um, it can be a little bit difficult to tell what's going on. And so this is one case in which a, a nutrient test can help you figure out what's going on. You know, if you pull these leaves and send them to a lab and the results come back fine for zinc, um, that could indicate that there's something else going on. Uh, magnesium deficiency um, and in other deficiencies that have this, uh, this kind of intervenal chlorosis where spaces in between the leaf veins are a lighter green then the veins themselves can look similar to a couple of types of herbicide damage as well. So it's really important to uh, make sure you're taking everything into account when you're trying to figure out what's going on. And uh, I will say that I have absolutely gone to orchards where someone's showing me a weird leaf symptom and I, I can't figure it out. And then all of the people that I email don't know what it is too. And so it can be really tough to tell sometimes what's going on, but this is one area where a leaf tissue test can maybe help you figure out what's going on. But just because you see something that looks like this doesn't necessarily mean that you have a deficiency. So some helpful tips when diagnosing an issue. Um, so if you look at the distribution of symptoms, um, you can look to see if it is all over the field or maybe in really specific areas of the field. And so this could indicate there's an issue with the soil. And so, you know, there might be, you can look at your NRCS soil survey map and see if there are different soil types. I mean, another thing that could be causing this is if your site has been graded. So they take, um, they, they level it out and move topsoil from one area to another area. That subsoil is lower fertility. And so you can see symptoms popping up there. If it's on orchard ed edges, it could be a drift issue. It could be something else. Um, if it's distributed throughout the orchard, but generally is a little bit greater in the lower portion of the canopy, um, that could be some issue with a spray. If it's random, uh, I would say it's more likely to be these diseases, but I have seen salinity issues exhibit a random distribution in an orchard before. Um, so don't rule anything out. Um, whenever I'm going into a site and I'm trying to diagnose an issue, I'm always asking them, what does your, have you pulled your soil, leaf tissue and water results recently. Um, if you haven't, you know, get it checked because it's a, it's a cheap way to rule out what's may or may not be going on. Okay, so moving on to soil tests. And so uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be going over a lot in this. Um, I'm going to be showing you a lot of numbers. I'm going to try to condense it into um, easy, something that's easy to take home. Um, but if you have any questions, you know, please do not hesitate to ask and Cheryl, feel free to interrupt me if you think something needs to be addressed that someone asks. Um, I, I like getting questions and so I'm more than happy to, to pause and go over something more in depth. Okay, so soil testing should be done pre-plant as well as post-plant. And so the reason why it's really important to get some soil tests done before planting anything, whether it's an orchard or a landscape is because you need to know what that site looks like before you put a plant in it because there could be issues with salinity, there could be issues with boron, and plants are not equally tolerant to a lot of issues. And so you wanna make sure that you are putting a plant in the ground and it's gonna succeed because you're, you're wasting money if you, um, you know, put an almond, for example, in a really high salt uh, ground, or I guess citrus is also very salt sensitive. And it's really critical to do it before planting because if you do need to do something to fix it, like maybe add gypsum to reduce uh, sodium levels, you can more easily incorporate amendments into the soil during the, the soil preparation process. Post-plant soil samples are best for monitoring salinity and water infiltration issues. Um, they can be useful to help keep an eye on changes in pH as well. And um, you do need to take them for your nutrient management plans as well so you can get nitrate levels. But 
for the most part, if you're going to be doing any major fixes, it needs to happen before plants go in the ground. And so nitrogen in particular is mobile because, uh, well, I'll show, I have a little diagram of soils later, um, but nit nitrogen won't stay in the root zone. The form of nitrogen that you add it in might slow down the leaching rate, but in general, it's very ephemeral in soil. So I really like looking at plant tissue tests when I'm trying to monitor uh, nitrogen at a particular site. So in general, post-plant soil sampling and even pre-plant is the same as leaf sampling. Um, you want to keep samples to one particular soil type. And so even if you might be managing a block the same way, it can be very helpful to know what's going on in your, if you have a sandy streak, for instance. And so going back to when I was talking about um, submitting things as one sample to a lab, for soils, you want to make sure that you're actually pulling soil from multiple areas in a field. And then you're gonna mix them up and then send one composite sample to a lab. So typically it's about eight to 10 subsamples. And I'll go over soil sampling later, but, um, and only give the lab what they ask for. Uh, we got, um, remember like one time someone sent a bunch of samples and a bunch of five gallon buckets once to us. And that was, uh, it was a, a problem because it took up a lot of space and they were hard to move around. And so labs don't like to see stuff like that. If you do a really good job at mixing up the soil before sending it in, um, you're going to get a good sample. So in general, you want to sample in the wetted zone and you're going to standardize how you sample. So soils will change a lot depending on where you are in the wetted zone and how deep you go in the soil. And so if you're doing something like pulling one subsample to eight inches, and another sample to 24 inches, you're not gonna get a very good sample. Um, you wanna make sure if you're doing zero to 12 inches, you're only pulling soil from zero to 12 inches. In general, um, you wanna keep on the outer edge of the wetted zone of whatever irrigation system you're using. Um, unless you're sampling for salinity, you do wanna stay away from the edges and mix really well before sending to a lab. And again, don't combine areas that you're gonna be fertilizing differently. And if you're trying to diagnose what's going on, don't pull soil from a well-performing area and soil from a very poorly performing area. So I have a little diagram here of some orchards with microsprinklers. So we have the tree in the center here, the microsprinkler here and a microsprinkler here. And so in general, you wanna sample from zero to 12 inches, um, discarding anything on, that's on the surface. So I know avocado orchards, mulch is a very important part. You don't really wanna be including a lot of that when you send it into this, the, the lab. You wanna pull samples from one half to three quarters of the wetted radius. So the radius is from the center of a circle to the edge. And so you're gonna be sampling in this approximate zone right here. So drip is more difficult because especially if you're planted on a berm and or you don't have great water infiltration rates at your site, water can run off the edge of a berm. And so this is a very idealized uh, representation of a, an orchard under drip irrigation with these really nice circular wetted radiuses. Um, but the concept is the same. You want to go towards the outer edge of the wetted radius. And so if you aren't sure what your wetted radius looks like, it can be helpful to go out after an irrigation and just kind of start poking around and seeing where that water ends up. So again, you know, if you're looking at a 40 acre block, uh, you want to pull eight to 12 of these little subsamples wandering around the orchard, you know, making sure you're sampling 40 or more feet apart combine them really well, send it into a lab. And just like leaf tissue sampling, if you have blocks that are more than 40 acres, you probably want to divide that up and send two samples in. It can sometimes be helpful to um, do more extensive sampling, especially if you're trying to figure out what's going on in a salt or soil that you think is affected by salinity. So the general soil fertility tests, um, you, you keep in the top foot of soil because 
that's where most of the nutrients are. And so that's what you're going to be constantly monitoring. And if you're doing something like surface applying uh, potassium or gypsum, for instance, it's not going to move really deep into the soil. And so um, uh, roots for most trees stay in about the, uh, the upper two feet of soil. So you're not missing anything if you're not doing regular sampling down to five feet. Um, and so if you're looking at salinity though, it's a little bit more difficult because salts can move around and they're not, um, they don't, they're not in the same concentration in the wetted zone. So you can sometimes have shallow issues with sodium that causes problems with infiltration. You can get sodium and chloride accumulating around the edges of wetted zones. Sometimes they can be leached deeper, but not leached out of the root zone. And um, there can be, like I've heard of one case where someone was trying to diagnose a boron toxicity issue in an orchard and there was boron really deep in the soil. And so if you're seeing something in your plant tissue tests and you're not finding the source of it in your soil, you know, sometimes it, it's, it can be beneficial just to kind of go crazy and try to see what's going on. So in general, when you're sampling for soil salinity, it's good to sample along the diameter of the wetted zone. So you're getting, and you mix it up really well, and so you're getting more accurate picture of what the entire root zone of the plant looks like. Sometimes it can be really helpful to separate the top inch or two to see if salts are accumulating up there. And you wanna do deeper sampling once you start your leaching program and before too, so you can see what it looks like to begin with to make sure that you're removing those salts from the wetted zone when you're leaching. So standard nutrient sampling can be really nice because it can start to alert you if a problem's popping up. Um, but if you have an extensive problem, it's you're probable that you're gonna to need to do more extensive sampling. So I know that um, it can seem like a lot if you're doing and turning in a ton of samples to a lab, but it's important to remember, especially if you're working with plants that are really salt sensitive, that the better picture you have of what's going on in your site when you're trying to diagnose an issue or try to figure out how bad a salinity problem is, the better decisions you're going to be able to make. So here's just a, a demonstration of uh, its water distribution in the root zone. And so it will show you just how different um, soils can look in a, a wetted zone in, um, in an orchard or um, anything that's under a, a drip or micro sprinkler irrigation. So you really, even if your, your uh, NRCS soil survey map says that everything looks the same, um, it's not going to be the same. And so um, it's really important to take that into account when you're sampling. Okay, so um, there are two general types of soil tests that you can get. You can get a general soil fertility test. So that's going to give you things like, you know, your pH, EC, all of the cations and all the micronutrients. And um, you, if you're dealing with salinity, or maybe you just like to get a lot of soil tests, you can also get the soil or the saturated paste extract. And so that's been specifically developed for um, evaluating salinity. And so something I, I did wanna um, mention is that if you're dealing with salts building up, having necrosis towards the edges of the leaf is a really classic symptom. Um, it's not always indicating salinity, um, but if you're seeing this and you suspect you might have salinity issues, it's a good idea to turn it in to a lab. Okay, so what's the difference between the two tests? Um, so the general soil fertility test is actually composed of a bunch of different tests that pull out specific groups of nutrients. And so these are developed to try to predict how well plants are going to grow in the soil and or how well they're going to respond to added fertilizer. Um, and so they use basically chemicals to extract this. And so when you're comparing it to a saturated paste extract, it only uses water. So there is something that's in common between the two. Um, pH and EC, especially in the Western states, is usually measured with a saturated paste extract. And so if you're, um, so those uh, should be the same or very similar across tests. So 
Because a saturated paste extract only uses water, it only distract or extracts the dissolved salts. So it's a really good assessment of salinity, but not really very good for assessing soil fertility. And so um, the way that a saturated paste is, is that a technician is going to add enough water until it gets to soil saturation, which is approximately twice, um, what, two times what field capacity is. And so um, and then that's what they're going to extract water from. And so Again, general soil fertility test uses chemicals, and so you're going to get higher numbers than a saturated paste extract, even if you submit the exact same soil sample. Okay, so going over units that you might see on a soil test. So you might see parts per million, which is a concentration, and that's the same as milligrams per kilogram or milligrams per liter. Milliequivalence is used either for looking at the cation exchange capacity, which I will explain in more detail in a sec, as well as um, you might be getting, so in soils, you might be getting milliequivalence per 100 grams of soil, and in water and saturated paste extracts, you'll be getting milligrams per liter. And so what that basically is, is it tries to take into account the charge of a cation or anion as well as the size. And that's because if you're looking at cations in a soil or water, something that has a plus one charge like sodium is not going to have the same activity as something with a plus two charge like calcium. And so it's different than concentration but it allows you to look at and compare the potential activities of particular cations or anions. And I, um, I will be going over this and using this more explicitly later. And so um, I know it can be, if you're not uh, in the world of chemistry, it can be a little bit um, hard to wrap your, your brain around. Um, I know I always struggled a lot with chemistry when I was in school. Um, but again, a parts per million is a concentration, so it's going to tell you how much of something is in a soil, but mill equivalence is going to tell you what activity that has in the soil. So if you're looking at salinity, um, you're going to get the EC, so that's measured in either decisiemens per meter or an older term is millimoles per centimeter. And so that's just a measurement that differentiates between salt, um, measures salt concentrations, uh, without getting too much into it, basically by um, conductivity. And so if it's a good quick and dirty test for looking at salinity issues at a site, and so there's a lot of research on crop response to salinity that uses this as a predictor of performance, but it doesn't really tell you what else is going on. And so I can tell you from looking at lab tests, and um, I should explain, a salt is something that's a a loose bond between something that's positively charged and negatively charged. So when we talk about salts, like if we're talking about dinner, um, we're talking about a compound called sodium chloride. And that is conveniently the same as uh, uh, elements that can cause damage to plants in really high concentrations. But it's also important to understand that most fertilizers, especially fertilizers that dissolve easily in water, those are salts as well. And so I can tell you that I would sometimes see soils that had been taken, or soil samples that had been taken just after a fertigation event, so after nitrogen was added. And so they have an elevated salinity because there's a lot of nitrate in the soil and nitrate does the same thing that you know, sodium or chloride will. And so it's um, not all salts are the same. Um, I guess I'll say the, the bad ones seem to, are, are the same as the ones that we like to put on our food to make it taste better. Um, but when we're talking about chemistry salts are not just sodium and chloride. So checking, um, there's some tricks that you can do to check for quality. Um, if the lab reports saturated paste extracts and mill equivalents per liter, that's a good thing. If you add the cations and anions in either a saturated paste extract or a water test, um, they should be within about 5 to 10% of each other. If they're exactly the same, that means that something's probably been estimated. If you multiply the EC of your water by 10, and I'll go over water tests towards the end, and it's about the sum of either the cations, I should say in milliequivalents per liter, or, or anions, then that's a good sign. 
And so again, if you see anything weird, the lab should be happy to recheck it. Um, okay, so something that uh, I'll start with fewer numbers. <laughs> okay, so um, something you'll get on both a general fertility or a saturated paste test is pH. And that's the, it's a measure of the concentration of hydrogen ions in solution. That's the, the more technical definition. But what it basically tells you is um, if you're going to be changing the pH, it'll tell you if you need to, to add something to raise the pH or um, add something to lower the pH. And it's really helpful for deciding how you're going to add micronutrients to your, um, to your orchard. And so in general, in Cal it's, it's not always necessary to lower the pH if you have a high pH. Um, I'll say in soils that have been very heavily affected by sodium, you can have a very high pH and reducing the sodium will also reduce the pH. Although I want to stress that gypsum does not technically change pH because it doesn't do anything with those hydrogen ions. Um, but if you just have high pH in your soil, I, it can be very cost prohibitive to try to manage pH intensively. And there are um, typically where you see issues with pH is with the metal micronutrients. And so they are, they're, um, nutrients are not available the same way at all, um, at all pHs. So in general, availability tends to be lower at low pHs and lower at high pHs. And so there is a sweet spot between about six and 7.5 where most nutrients are the most available. And so if we're talking about wide scale crop production and you might see something like a zinc deficiency at a high pH soil, sometimes it's just easier to add the zinc to the plants rather than try to adjust the pH to try to make things more available. And so I will also say if you're deciding if you, how you want to add a metal micronutrient to, to an orchard. Um, if you have a really high pH, adding it to the soil is not very effective because it's just going to be made unavailable. Again, ECE is a quick measure of dissolved salts in the soil, so it's a really quick assessment of salinity. So the cation exchange capacity is really important for understanding the relationship and how to manage calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. And so uh, I will have a little diagram next, um, but in general, the CEC is directly related to the amount and type of clay as well as organic matter. Um, and so I just wanna note for the tests that you get, a lot of labs will estimate it based off of what they pull from the cation extraction test. And so if you don't submit a good sample to the lab, this is a problem because, you know, if you submit a sample with gypsum in it, and so this test, it's gonna be pulling off the calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium, and it's gonna be calculating the CEC based off of what it pulls out of the soil, and you've artificially added something that has a lot of calcium in it, you're not gonna get an accurate picture of what your CEC looks like. So I'll say that it is, if you get it, submit a good sample, it's a pretty close estimation. Um, it can be helpful to actually ask them to test CEC, um, especially if you're managing sites long-term, so you just know what it is. Um, it's just a really expensive test to do, and so um, the, the estimation tends to be fine for most purposes. So again, the saturation uh, percentage is what you're gonna get from your saturated paste test, and that's how much water is needed to get your soil to that point. It can be used to estimate texture, um, but I would honestly say if you want to get uh, texture at your site, you should just get that tested. Um, and I'll say the CEC is gonna come from your general fertility test. The EC and pH will come from either general fertility or the saturated paste test. Okay, so the cation exchange capacity. It's a measure of a soil's capacity to hold on to positively charged ions. So the ones that we typically talk about here in California, because soil pHs tend to be higher, are calcium, magnesium, soil, and potassium. If we're talking about acidic soils, aluminum can play a role, um, but there are some areas where there are acidic soils, but at least um, 
for the majority of uh, at least the areas that I work with, it's all um, neutral to more basic. And so how that's generated is um, you have soil particles that age, so they're broken down very slowly over time in a process called weathering. And what that does is it exposes negatively charged surfaces. And so I have this little rectangles here that have negative charges on them. That's like a little, my, uh, my Microsoft Paint representation of a clay particle. Um, those tend to be very flat. And the reason why they generate the majority of the CEC for a soil is because they have a really high surface area to volume ratio. And if you've ever looked at an uh, electron microscope picture of a, so a clay particle, it's just a bunch of flat little plates. And so it's really good for holding on to things. And so positively charged compounds in the soil solution, which is the area around these little clay platelets, will very loosely bind to these soil particles. And so this not only affects the soil's ability to hold on to nutrients, it's also critically important for soil structure. And that is because calcium has a stronger positive charge. It's a plus two instead of a plus one, like you might see over here with sodium. And it's smaller. So I, I try to make the font a little bit smaller on this. And so what it does is it brings clay particles together in a process called flocculation. And that allows soil aggregates to form. And so in general, you like to see calcium in soils um, and you don't like to see sodium because it has the opposite effect of calcium. It will it has a, a less strong charge, so it's not as good at holding these negatively charged soil particles together. And so it will push particles apart, kind of like what you see out here. Um, although I didn't have as many soil or sodium, uh, little um, sodium ions out here. And so um, that's why if you have uh, sodium issues at a site, you can see issues with infiltration. And I'll go over that a little bit more in depth later. But again, these negatively charged clay particles will loosely bind to positively charged ions. And so that means that your soil has a reservoir for holding on to nutrients like potassium and calcium and magnesium. It is an inherent soil property. Um, you, if you're working in a raised bed and you can add large amounts of organic matter every year to a, a sandy soil, um, you can adjust this, um, but I would say in most agricultural sites where you're not adding in a lot of organic matter every year, I would just think of it as an inherent part of your soil and it's just gonna change how you manage potassium. So the easiest way to think of the CEC is a cup. And so you can fill it with good things like calcium and magnesium and potassium, or you can fill it with bad things like sodium. And so if you have a large CEC, it can hold more of those things, but it takes either, um, it, and it takes more time to deplete, but it takes more inputs to fill up again. If you have a sandy soil, it's a smaller cup. And so it takes less time to deplete if you're thinking about nutrients, um, but it's easier to fill back up again. So you can use smaller doses. Okay, so looking at the cations, I've separated the results that you might get for a fertility test. General fertility test is a saturated paste extract. Again, general fertility test uses chemicals to pull out the nutrients, and so you're gonna get higher numbers. And I wanna say, I just made these numbers up. <laughs> and so you're not gonna, the saturated paste extract is not gonna be exactly 10% of what's on your general fertility test. I just didn't feel like making up different numbers. Um, so when you're looking at a general fertility test, it's either going to be reported as parts per million or um, what I really like to see is percent of the cation exchange capacity. And so the cation exchange capacity is going to be reported as milliequivalents per 100 gram of soil. And so what they're going to do is they're going to take this, um, convert it to milliequivalents, and then calculate the size of the CEC and then generate the percent CEC. If you get the saturated paste extract, they'll report in parts per million and they'll just convert it to mill equivalents per liter. So when I'm looking at a general fertility test and actually a saturated paste extract, I don't really like looking at the parts per million. I like looking at the percent CEC and the percent mill equivalents per liter. Because again, if you go back to when I was explaining what mill equivalents were, it's the activity of these cations. And so 
I know that one mil equivalent of calcium is the same as one mil equivalent of magnesium, even though the size is different. Or one mil equivalent of calcium is the same as one mil equivalent of sodium, even though the charge is different. Again, that calculation takes charge and size into account. So if I'm looking at the CEC, I can start thinking about, or the percent CEC, I can start thinking about how much calcium is there compared to magnesium, potassium, and sodium. And so that will help me think about what's going on in that soil. So in general, if you have more than 5% CEC or sodium on the CEC, that can mean trouble for uh, plants that are more salt sensitive. If I have less than 2% potassium, that could mean there's low availability to the plants. But keep in mind, if you are banding potassium in the soil and you're avoiding it when you're soil sampling, um, this may not be an accurate representation of what's actually available to the plant. And that's because you have this area where there's just a lot of potassium. So you use mill equivalents per liter or you can to calculate gypsum requirements, um, but I'll say there's no standards that exist for predicting plant response to nutrients based on the saturated paste tests. And so in general, if you have more than three mill equivalents per liter for sodium, um, that can spell trouble for salt sensitive plants. Okay, so something I got asked occasionally is cation ratios. Where you, um, I guess there's some folks that pr uh, promote maintaining very specific ratios of calcium, magnesium, and potassium. As far as I'm aware, um, research doesn't really show that to be very necessary and it can be very expensive because you're going to have to be maintaining that on an annual basis. But you can absolutely have issues that pop up if you do something crazy to your soil. So um, if you have very, if you apply a lot of potassium to soils that have small CEC, so again, as a small cup for holding those, um, those cations, you can force off other cations from the CEC and you just have too much potassium. And that's going to interfere with uptake of magnesium and calcium. And so that's because plants uh, will or can view uh, uh, molecules that have similar charge and size similarly, and so it will just reduce the plant's ability to take up other nutrients. And of course, if we're dealing with salinity, um, long-term additions of sodium will uh, take up too much space in the CEC and it can destroy soil structure and cause damage with plants. Okay, and so again, um, sodium will push uh, clay particles apart. Okay, so looking at a saturated paste extract. Um, so the SAR is another way of looking at the negative effects of sodium in your soil. And so without getting into the calculation, it basically you just compare the amount of sodium you have to the amount of calcium and magnesium because um, sodium is negative to soil structure and calcium and magnesium are beneficial for soil structure. And so SAR above three can cause issues with salt sensitive species. The exchangeable sodium percentage is the percent of CEC devoted to sodium. And they're usually pretty close, or uh, ESP is usually pretty close to SAR. So chloride is the amount of chloride in your sodium or your soil. Um, anything more than three mill equivalents per liter is bad for sensitive plants. Okay, bicarbonates and carbonates are in your soil and they do indicate some, if you have a lot of it, they can indicate you have some free lime. And boron is, uh, you wanna keep an eye on it if you're growing boron sensitive species. So something like uh, almonds are boron sensitive. Okay, so other test results you might see on a general fertility test. Um, you'll get nitrate, usually reported as nitrate, nitrogen. Um, sulfate, phosphorus, zinc, iron, copper, manganese, and boron. So again, um, it's best to always monitor for deficiencies with leaf tissue analysis. Um, nitrate is negatively charged and it doesn't stay in soils. So again, it's best to monitor with leaves, um, but you will need this for your nutrient management plans. Um, phosphorus, in tree crops, there's not a lot of research showing a growth response. Um, I will say you might get, uh, if you're in a, 
there's different phosphorus tests done depending on the, the pH of the soil. And so um, you, depending on if you're in a, a neutral to basic soil, you're going to be getting the Olson bicarb test. If you're in acidic soil, um, you're going to get the Bray test. And so I'm just mentioning this because the standards are going to be different between the two. And so just keep that in mind. Um, zinc, uh, again, um, at least in tree crops that I work with, foliar applications are pretty standard. And so you don't want to apply zinc to the soil if the pH is low. Copper, iron, and manganese deficiency is typically rare. Um, and boron, the saturated paste results are more accurate for assessing hazards, but some labs include saturated paste analysis as part of their fertility tests. Okay, so um, for trying to fix salinity, um, you're going to want to know how much amendments to add. And so in general, you want to add enough to either replace one milliequivalent of sodium from the soil. And keep in mind that these amounts are only for a six acre inch slice. Um, or you can also add it to your water to increase the calcium amount. I will just say, keep in mind that these can uh, add to the salt load of a, a water sample. And so um, just keep that in mind if you're adding it in through the water. And so the reason why you need to add something to soil to amend salinity is because sodium must be, it's gonna bind to the soil. And so just adding water is not gonna force it out of the soil. You have to add something that's gonna replace it on the CEC. And so usually it's calcium because um, the beneficial effects that calcium has on soil structure. So sources of calcium are for the most part gypsum. So again, gypsum technically doesn't change pH, but if you have a sodic soil, it also has a high pH. Fixing the sodium issue will also reduce the pH. Lime will increase pH. And so if you have a, a soil that's neutral or a high pH, you don't wanna add lime. If you do have calcium-based free lime in your soils, you can add an acid, which will break down the free lime and release calcium. So basically you're just forming gypsum in the soil. Okay, I can skip that. Um, so if you are removing salt from, or sodium um, from soils, as well as chloride, you also have to add water. So you have a leaching table here, and I'll say that it assumes that you have a high quality water source. So that's water that has less than one decisiemen per meter. Soils will never be less salty than the water they're leached with. So if you have a salt sensitive plant and you're intending to leach, but you have a very salty wa irrigation water source, you're, you probably won't be fixing the problem. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind if you're evaluating a new site and you think you might have to manage sodium on a regular basis. You need to have access to a high quality water source in order to remediate it or keep it from getting bad. And I just wanna add that this assumes leaching is done over several small applications with at least two days of drainage in between that's more efficient water-wise. Okay, so just to kind of wrap up the soil section, I believe, um, just keep in mind, soils take time to fix. If you've let a problem go for a long time or you're, you know an issue's popping up and you don't feel like taking care of it, it's gonna get worse if you don't take care of it. And so it's always better to monitor closely and start, or you wanna do maintenance, you don't wanna do reclamation. And so this also goes with potassium, um, especially if you're working with a crop that takes a lot of potassium out of the soil. You, you don't wanna to get to the point where your plants are super deficient and all the calcium in the soil or the potassium in the soil has been depleted. You wanna add what's removed every single year with the crop. So last is water tests. Um, they're a little less complicated than soils. Um, so in general, for water sampling, you wanna make sure you're pulling water samples from every source you're gonna be using. So that can be canal water as well as wells. And if you have multiple wells, you wanna look at them separately. If you're pulling samples from a well, make sure you pull or let the well run for at least 30 minutes before pulling a sample. And this is critically important because again, your soil is gonna eventually look like what your water looks like, especially um, if you have sodium and chloride and boron issues. And so you wanna make sure you monitor this on a regular basis. And I believe for nutrient management plans, so you need to take annual samples anyways. 
So agricultural laboratories are going to have some sort of agricultural suitability test. And so that's what you can ask for. So uh, for plants that are very sensitive to salt issues, um, water with more than one part per million of boron, 100 parts per million of either sodium or chloride, or uh, 1,000 TDS, um, which is total dissolved solids, um, is a problem. And that's about uh, 1.5 uh, EC. So in general, um, labs are probably going to estimate TDS based on EC. So you can just ask your lab what they did. And so I will say these are general guidelines. Um, it's not unheard of for salt sensitive plants to perform well above these levels. I'm not saying if you're evaluating a site and you're planning on planting something that's salt sensitive and it's above these levels, you should go ahead with it. Um, but uh, it's a risk. And I will say that um, salt is, when you're looking at salts in irrigation water, it's very complicated because it's not just sodium and chloride. Calcium and magnesium also play a role in how well plants respond to salty conditions. Um, but uh, in general, I, I wouldn't recommend planting a salt sensitive plant species if you have the choice in a site that has um, levels above this, especially if you have something that you can grow. And so in the Central Valley, we have a very salt tolerant tree crop, it's pistachios. Um, and I know that I, I've definitely told people um, to not plant a salt sensitive species in certain sites because they just won't do well. Um, okay. So these are generally what you're gonna get from an irrigation water report. And so you're gonna see stuff that's pretty similar to your um, soil reports. You're gonna get pH, cations, um, carbonates and bicarbonates, chloride, EC, boron, and SAR. Um, and so again, if we're looking at these guidelines, we know that sodium chloride, boron, and EC are all like, fine for salt sensitive plants. Carbonates and bicarbonates can be useful because they are found, um, well, they can cause a, uh, a precipitation issue if they bind with calcium and magnesium. Um, and I think, uh, so I will say carbonates, bicarbonates can be present, um, well, in higher soil pH, but um, carbonates in particular are present in water with really, really high pH. Um, but in general, if you add up um, the molar equivalents of calcium and magnesium and carbonates and bicarbonates, they both are above two, you could have some pre pre uh, precipitation issues. So um, general, the best way to deal with that is to acidify the soil or to acidify the irrigation water to drive off the carbonates. Um, the best way to do that, actually, the only way to do that properly is to send a irrigation water sample to a lab and they'll do what's called a titration test. And they're gonna calculate how much of a particular acid you need to add to your irrigation water to get it to the desired pH. So again, SAR is a sodium absorption ratio. And so it's the, the ratio of sodium to the com combination of calcium and magnesium. In irrigation water though, you'll get what's called the adjusted SAR. And so that takes into account or carbonates and bicarbonates because they will bind with calcium and magnesium and actually basically remove them from, I guess, the equation and um, make them unable to counter the negative effects of sodium in soils. And so it's a better picture of what sodium is gonna do in your soil if you have high pH water with a lot of carbonates and bicarbonates. Okay, so um, I included this in the irrigation water section because um, I wanted to make sure I got through the irrigation water amount. I just have some quick calculations for calculating the amount of nitrogen in your irrigation water or in your soils. So again, nitrogen in soils, is um, it's ephemeral. It will move with irrigation water. And so if you're doing it in your soil, doing this calculation, it's just a snapshot. Irrigation water, especially if it's like well water, well, even surface water, it's much more stable. And this can be really useful because if you're calculating how much nitrogen a site needs and you have a lot of nitrates in your water, you can, you should be reducing the amount of applied nitrogen. And if you have a low nitrogen use crop and a really high nitrogen area, so um, there's a lot of dairies in my area. And so those, you can have high nitrates in irrigation water close to dairies. 
um, you may not need to really apply any nitrogen. So I have these little calculations right here. It's important to remember though that uh, you need to make sure you're using the correct calculations. So um, some labs report results, water, irrigation water results as nitrate. Some report as nitrate nitrogen. So you need to make sure that you, you use the correct calculation. Okay, something to keep in mind with irrigation water is that if you have poor quality irrigation water that can cause infiltration issues. And that is because, again, calcium helps pull soil or clay particles together that improve soil structure, sodium forces it apart. Another component of that is that you have salts in the soil solution or the, the water that's in between soil particles. And those also help push soil clay particles a little closer together and improve infiltration. And so those kind of form this little equilibrium in soils and that will help dictate how easily water moves through the soil. So in general, if you have a lot of sodium, that's bad for infiltration. If you have a really high EC, that's good for infiltration, but causes other issues. And so we have this little chart here to help you determine if you're gonna have water infiltration issues developing. You know, in Southern California, there can be a lot of salt affected soils. So having low EC water may not be, well, it's probably more applicable to landscape situations, but in the Central Valley, particularly if you have access to canal water that comes from snowmelt from the Sierra Nevada, that's very pure. And um, I do see infiltration issues with folks that are irrigating with canal water. And so I will say that in general, that's, it's a problem, but it's a really great problem to have because the solution is pretty simple and cheap. You just broadcast gypsum or you inject it into your irrigation water. Um, so in general, about a ton of gypsum per acre applied to the soil surface in the early summer can really, really help with infiltration issues if you have low EC and low sodium in your, so your, your irrigation water. If you have the opposite end, high EC, or sorry, high SAR and, um, and or high EC, then you need to do uh, uh, leaching. Okay, so we can take, I'm happy to take any and all questions. Um, if you're, you have any other questions, I have my contact information here, although this is to, the phone number is to my office and uh, until Madera County moves into the red zone, um, the best way to reach me is email. I have a website um, that goes, that, that posts articles about uh, vineyards as well as orchards. That's called uh, San Joaquin Valley Trees and Vines. I do have a podcast uh, with another farm advisor and it's a general orchard podcast. And so we go over a bunch of topics because we interview people who do research in certain areas. And we do, um, we do series as well as just one-off episodes. And so we have series on uh, nitrogen management, irrigation, um, navel orange worm, if anyone manages a crop that is, navel orange worm is an issue. We have other fun series plans planned in the future. So thank you so much. And I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll just go through them, I think, in the order that we got them. Um, there was one. Okay, so how, one is in the chat here. How often do you take tissue samples? And also, um, how do you determine when plants are the most stable for tissue sampling? So, how often depends on, I guess, I guess how obsessive you are. Um, you I would say at minimum, if you're just managing plant fertility and we're not talking about nutrient management plans, I would say once every two years is fine. You can take more samples if you want to, um, and you can monitor how things change over time, and that can be a really useful way for you to learn about your crop, but I would say at minimum once every two years, but with the nitrogen or the nutrient management plans, you need to take it every year. Um, and so, how you determine when it's stable is basically based on when it's recommended that you take the tissue samples. And so generally that's when leaves are done expanding and um, because leaves will supply nutrients to the developing fruit, it's when that fruit is no longer pulling a bunch of nutrients. And so take almonds, for example, we recommend that you pull leaves in July. And by that time, uh, at least if we're talking about non-parel, you know, whole split is typically has started you harvest 
about a month later. And so nut development is basically complete at that point in time. And so I will say, um, just call the lab that you're gonna be working with and ask them what they recommend and they'll tell you. For horticultural crops, um, I guess I forgot to mention this, it's a little bit more complicated because there, there's a lot of crops and not a lot of standards out there. And so in general, you can sample the most recently matured leaves. Um, that's, that's the standard for horticulture. And so um, labs will often have general guidelines for a lot of crops um, that will basically, because you're not trying to get the maximum amount of yield off of that site, um, there is a little bit more wiggle room. Um, but that's what I would say. And in general, you don't wanna be pulling leaves when the colors start to change basically in the fall because they're remobilizing nitrogen and potassium and storing it. Okay, so um, is it best to pull soil samples after a few irrigation cycles without fertigation? It depends on what you want to look at. Um, we recommend that you pull for salinity in the fall because you've added on an entire season's worth of irrigations. If you're just trying to diagnose something that's going wrong, I would say when you decide to send stuff to a lab is fine. Um, if you're doing nutrient management plans, I mean, they're due before you're putting on fertigations for the most part, um, at least for the crops that I work with. So you're definitely doing it before then, um, probably also before you're putting on any irrigation. So it doesn't, if you don't know the wetted zone, it's definitely helpful to do it after a full irrigation. Um, but um, Again, if, if a, the crop is in the ground and you're managing it, for the most part, you know, nitrate, I'm not gonna say it doesn't matter, but again, it's just a snapshot what's happening in time. And unless you're doing things like adding in a lot of micronutrients or gypsum, for example, um, that's not gonna change over time. That's gonna be fairly stable at a site. So salinity in the fall for other purposes, it's, uh, I wouldn't say there's a hard and fast rule. Okay, uh, the next one, what is the best type of chelated iron for foliar treatment of iron chlorosis? Um, I will pass on that question because in general, um, if you're looking at different micronutrient compounds, um, I guess I'll say I know this is true for zinc. Um, I don't know if this is true for iron, but if you're applying something in a sulfate form, the absorption is higher, but you have a higher risk of phytotoxicity. And so um, what I would just say is that there's probably not a whole lot of difference between products. Um, just make sure you read the label to follow the guidelines and make sure you don't burn leaves off the plant. Okay, um, do you know what the best soil test or tester is for the home garden? Um, I would honestly, like any agricultural suitability or ag lab will be able to give you a good result. Um, and I, yeah, that's what I would say. Um, labs have agronomists there that will help you understand soil samples and give you some guidelines and some tips for fertilization. Um, and so, you know, I, the, I know the lab that I worked at, they got um, home, we got homeowner uh, soil samples quite a bit. Um, so um, any, any ag testing lab is, is fine for home gardening purposes. And I, I can't really speak to um, like if a, a big box home supply store offers those tests. I don't, um, I will say generally if you are doing like they give you like these little strips or reagents and you do the testing yourself, that tends to not be very accurate. And, um, you know, for pH, it's probably fine. I know there's little nitrogen, well, nitrate uh, strip tests. Those are also fairly accurate, but um, other things I, I would, I would want to look at before saying if they're good or bad. Okay. Uh, the next one, can the saturation percentage be used to calculate approximate irrigation needs of a soil to reach field capacity? They can help you. Yeah. Um, cause again, the saturation percentage is two times the field capacity. Um, honestly though, if you are irrigating 
in an agricultural setting, um, I guess in tree crops, I don't know if you can use soil sensors as easily in agronomic crops where the land is tilled on a really frequent basis. I would just say install a, uh, install a soil probe or at, well, multiple soil probes at multiple depths and use the guidelines that they recommend based on the soil texture. Um, it's, you need to know what's going on in the soil and in plants where we have the ability to measure plant stress, you need to be able to measure plant stress to be able to uh, manage irrigation well. Um, I, I have uh, talked to folks that aren't managing their irrigation closely and think that they're doing a good job and they're either sometimes under irrigating, sometimes over irrigating, and you just, you can't do it accurately unless you're measuring it on a regular basis. And sending those samples to a lab is not a, a good way to do it. You need to have um, something in the soil to measure that. Okay, uh, the next one. Um, the general practice for avocado monitoring is to pull a soil sample in the spring to see what you're starting with mm -hmm. and a tissue sampling in the fall to see what's in the tree. And um, this is from Kevin. He says he's wondering if it's also wise to pull a soil sample in the fall to determine if you've messed up the soil's balance of nutrients by over applying something. Um, if you're worried about salinity, yes, I would. Um, I think that, again, if you're, so the only balance that I would necessarily be worried about is if you're over fertilizing with potassium. And the only time I've ever seen potassium deficiency artificially induced because of over fertilization is in a really, really sandy soil. Um, I wouldn't quite call it beach sand, but it's not far apart from beach sand. Um, and so very, very low clay content. I, it's going to take, if you are chronically over applying um, something like potassium in a soil that has more clay to it, it's not going to, you're not going to have problems pop up in one year. And if you're doing a leaf tissue test on an annual basis, you'll be able to see, um, you know, if, uh, well, to some extent, you'll be able to see if nutrients are starting to creep upwards. Um, and again, I, uh, I believe avocados and citrus you base, you fertilize based on crop removal rates anyways. And so if you know that you have about 2% potassium in the CEC, you should just be applying what you remove every year for the most part. Okay, um, can you explain again why water with low EC can increase infiltration issues? Yes, so um, you have a, a dynamic between soil particles and what's in the, the soil solution or the water that surrounds those soil particles. And so you have cations that will bind to the soil particles themselves and help pull those clay particles together. And you also have cations in, or um, in salts in general in the soil solution that also help kind of push those soil particles closer together. And so you can, you could kind of almost think of it like magnets where you have um, you have positive ends that are, if you have two ends with the same charge, they will repel each other, but opposite ends attract. And so you're, you have things that are pushing things together in the soil solution and you have things that are close to them that are either pulling them together or pushing them apart. And so if you don't have a lot of those salts in the actual soil solution, there's nothing there to help push things together. And so that's why you can have those infiltration issues. I hope that was more clear. Okay, um, if attempting to leach salt with rainwater, would it be best to apply the rainwater in the normal wetted zone or in the periphery where the salts are likely to be more concentrated? I'm guessing this is a homeowner. Um, if you can control where the rainwater is applied, um, you generally wanna make sure you're applying it where the salts are concentrated and making sure you have some gypsum to help remove that sodium from the CEC. If you're just talking about an orchard, um, the water's gonna fall all over the place, so it's gonna leach everything. Um, but if you're adding gypsum, you wanna make sure to add gypsum to the areas where you're irrigating. Okay, so I have one that I'm not exactly sure, but I'll read it to you as it is. Um, so using your, and it's negative VE soil plate with positive VE cations in the soil solution, enhanced particle binding, um, the gypsum, does it improve water infiltration or stating the opposite if soil plates are dispersed? 
and then water infiltration is reduced. So in soil particles or clay plates are dispersed, um, you get poor water infiltration. Okay. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure if I was reading that one correctly. <laughs> okay. Um, is there any standard, is there, or I, I know you covered this one, um, if you could go through um, the standardization of tissue and soil reports. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's the lab results and there is the actual standard that's been developed through research. And so um, the standard is what you're going to apply that result or you're going to apply the standard to the result and say, okay, is my plant deficient? Is it sufficient in this? And so that, that standard has been developed based off of fertilization response trials. So it'll either add differing amounts of fertilizer and um, you know see what the yield is and then they'll pull the, the leaf tissue tests for that. Um, okay um, and then can you provide a little more discussion on the relationship between compacted soil and toxic levels of uptake of excess nutrients? Um, I don't think that there is necessarily toxicity um, I would say that uh, it just can sometimes improve uptake, but when I've read that, it's been in a container soil. Okay, just a couple more here. Um, and in regard to sampling um, the leaves, is there a certain part of the tree from where you would take the leaves? So if there's a, a testing protocol established, um, well, in general, you want to, so like an orchard tree, you want to pull it from at least six feet high. Um, I, I'm, I, and then uh, towards the outer portion of the canopy. Um, if you're looking at a horticultural plant, it's just the most recently matured leaf, which is going to be towards the tip of the, uh, the tip of the branch. Okay, and then um, with the lab tests, if uh, homeowners or home gardeners can't afford the lab tests um, and they're just small to medium sized gardens, are there any self testing devices or um, commercial? No, I mean, depending on the lab, a, a general soil fertility test will run from 30 to $60. Um, and so I guess I don't know what the generally the cost of what you might get from a home test. Um, but I mean, if you're thinking about getting like your own pH meter, that can run a couple hundred dollars. So um, I, I mean, I guess you can shop around to different labs, but um, I guess I, from my impression, if you're just doing one sample, I, I, general soil fertility tests aren't gonna cost you that much money. Um, sometimes you can go through testing services or services will offer things like fertilizer recommendations and fertility consulting on top of that. And that can sometimes drive up the price. Um, but if you like, I guess most labs just don't, um, they don't cost uh, that much. And I guess I don't know, like if a, a test that you get in a big box store is like $10. Yeah, that's a lot more expensive, but um, I'll just say you're getting what you pay for. Then I, I know that's kind of a, a hard, answer but I just these these tests take expertise because you have people that do them they take chemicals to do it and so um, you know there's a reason why they they cost what they do I, I will say um, labs that are out of state um, if labor costs are lower um, sometimes test, tests are cheaper but uh, then you have to also pay for shipping okay and then we just have this one final um, one if you could explain what FIZZ is which is listed on somebody's sample uh, soil sample report. Yeah so that's uh, the FIZZ test and it's just a really quick and dirty analysis of whether or not you have carbonates in your soil and so basically just add a little bit of acid to the soil and see if it fizzes and if it fizzes you have uh, carbonates in it. Okay I think that's all the questions we had. Thank you Phoebe for your mm -hmm. presentation. Yeah thanks for hosting me. Thank you, um, everybody. We hope you have a good rest of your day.